Welcome to the RT Rugby Podcast. I'm Michael Glennon. On the panel today, we have former Ireland head coach Eddie O'Sullivan and former Ireland hooker Bernard Jackman, alongside RT Rugby producer Wes Liddy. Um, hi, lads. We're going to take a quick look back at the weekend and see why Ireland fell short again on another day. It's the third year in a row that they've been in the mix uh, on the final day for the championship. But first, we're going to hear from Ireland boss Andy Farrell. He addressed a question about team tactics versus France and first where he thought it went wrong on the night. Uh, quite a few things actually. Um, uh, I think there, there was enough opportunities there for us to uh, to win two games, and um, yeah, we we certainly wasn't clinical enough with uh, with the opportunities that we had. And um, if you don't take your chances in, in big games like this, then you 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 come unstuck eventually, and, and it's, a, it's an obvious thing to say, but. Um, with enough entries into the into uh, the French 22, and uh, didn't come away, didn't come away with uh, with the points. Um, it's as simple as that, really. Um, yeah, we uh, at half time. I suppose the, uh, the, the 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 chat was about uh, about belief. Um, it was a little bit off, and. Uh, yeah, obviously the score just after half time uh, wasn't wasn't great, but uh, we killed our own momentum at times, and then that stopped the fluidity of, of things. And uh, I suppose the errors uh, that we made were across the board. It wasn't just one area, but uh, I suppose being being clinical in, uh, in in the last third of the pitch was was the main point. The, the plan, the plans, the, the plans um, is, is is pretty simple, Murray. It's the it's the feel and the flow of the game, you know. And the guys, the guys out there, have that feel and flow. Um, obviously, uh, Connor planted himself uh, um, early doors, and obviously it was uh, a long range kick that he he um, he'd been banging over for, for fun in the warm up, etc. So he backed himself to do that, and. Um, I suppose you, you you probably get into um, the, the the point just before half time as as well of whether we um, go for Porso or, or whether we go uh, to the corner. Look, uh, I beg the players to, to 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 feel to feel what's right, to feel the flow of the game, and and uh, you know I suppose everyone would would judge the decision. Uh, what's right and what's wrong, but I would I would more so try and go down the line of once you make a decision, it's it's how you execute that on the back of it, and and uh, those are the those are the bits that I'll be critical of. That was Andy Farrell speaking after the game, and um, Eddie, with all the talk in the build-up about making this a test match first and foremost, getting the win, and um, when we look back at Ireland's previous two matches in Paris, it was 10-9, it was 15-13. Do you think that they failed to mould the game um, after they knew exactly what they needed into a, into a game that suited them? Um, I, I, I would say that they go no one in what they had to do. They, 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 they was clear in their mind, but I, I'm not sure they knew themselves and the think where they were going. Like, I mean, I think the most important thing is to win the test game. And the, the, the odds of doing that, I suppose, by, by you know, six points or four tries, both of them were on the table. But I thought the notion that they were, you know, turning away three points early in the game, going to the corner, they didn't need to do that. I mean, they just need to win the game by six points, it turned out. Or even, like, it, it, that to me was the route they should have gone after. But for some reason, they were kicking to the corner, which maybe thinks they were going after the bonus point win, you know, the four tries, which probably historically was never going to happen. They were going to score four tries. And we scored four tries against in France before 2006, but we lost the game. So I just thought there was a lack of clarity of thought on what their mission really was. And I thought their mission going out should have been fairly straightforward, was to win the game and win it by, by the six points they needed, you know. Didn't it look like that at the start when Murray took his shot from inside the own half, that that was seemed to be setting out the benchmark of what way we go yeah. from? But suddenly there was this pivot away. They turned away six points. Like, no, at the end of the day, it didn't matter because they were well beaten. But at that moment in the game, nobody knew that. And in fact, at half time, we were right in the, in, the, in the middle of the game. And we had, we had done a lot of things well in the first half in terms of not being bullied by France, which is always a good starting point for trying to win in Paris. Because on occasion, we have been bullied by France. 
and we've been blown away. So I thought physically we were matching France. I mean, the ease with which we scored our first try in the pick and jam, you know, if we got into that position again, uh, in, in any other part of the game, in the back is to score again. So physically, I thought we were in a good place. I thought the sudden pivot away to trying to score tries kind of bemused me a bit. And then going into half time, you think, well, okay, they'll steady the ship, they'll come out, we'll see uh, an, an intensely a purpose around this. We, we were right in this still, and instead, the wheels effectively come off. Um, so maybe that's the context of talking about, about, oh, we felt we left behind us. But to me, there was. There was mixed signals coming to what they were trying to do. Bernard? Yeah, I think, you know, afterwards, Andy Farrell said, oh, we had enough chances to win the game two or three times. And, but that's probably, you know, we need a lot of chances to score. Uh, you know, our, our ability to, to score tries, you know, quickly, early in the, early in the phases is, is pretty poor. Uh, so we have to manufacture pressure to get in five yards out. And now we're lying at mall. It's not just against France, but probably over the last two years, our efficiency to turn that into into more than uh, another penalty is quite poor. Uh, so there's areas of the game. So like France, France got a try is very easy, but that's that's credit to them. <laughs> I don't think you know you can. Lots of teams have possession but don't win the games, and Ireland seem to to think that it's okay to have lots of possession. But I think they need to be looking at um, how how we're going to score a little bit easier. Um, and also, just interestingly, you know, he spoke about half time. The whole chat was around belief, and you know the players didn't have the belief to win. And so either the players are still mentally scarred from you know two three hammerings by England, you know the failure of the World Cup, four Six Nations last year. Um, so and then one way to create belief is obviously winning. So you know the the win against Scotland, Wales, and Italy might not have been enough to build that belief. But the other way is the quality of your training and the game plan. So if you really believe in the game plan and you believe in how you're going to go and dismantle an opposition, that gives you belief. So the fact that 17, 13, I think it was at halftime, that we were lacking belief, I mean, it's, it's quite strange, you know, and it maybe points a finger at, at bigger issues. And again, that might be just, you know, lack of confidence or lack of leadership group or whatever, but that's worrying because to, to win those tight test matches, you, you need belief. And, and we're not going to maybe pick it up by winning games as easy as we have in the past. So we have to have a better plan. Wes, what did you think then? Like Johnny Sexton addressed about going to the corner. He said that because France can get a try out of anywhere, it, they thought it might run into a game like that where if the chance presented itself to go to the corner, you should do it. But it probably didn't tally with what they were talking about in advance uh, in terms of playing the test match. Yeah, I think there's a lot to kind of digest in what the two lads said there and in a lot of the talk since the game um, and to be honest I found it a very kind of confusing game to marry up um, with what certainly with what I saw and with some of the common post it um, certainly going to the corner and, and an issuing three points doesn't manifestly suggest a lack of belief is your first problem um, I didn't pick up on a lack of belief certainly in terms of their, their physical commitment in the first half um, and equally I don't know what the lads think. I'd be curious, but I, I thought it was a, a an interesting line for Andy Farrell to go down, um, possibly unintended, but um, effectively throwing the blame back at the players um, and questioning their belief or their, their morale to a lesser extent. Um, when really it seems that the main calling card of this uh, management regime since he came in has been built upon... Um, this positivity in the camp and a good relationship with the players. I thought it was a very, I, I'm not sure in the long term how wise a move that was for him because if the relationship with the players isn't strong, well, then everything else better be really strong. And we probably haven't seen a lot of evidence of that. And, and I agree with Eddie 100% that there was a lack of clarity more than a, a lack of belief. It's hard to separate the two, but. I just think the, the the media coverage, particularly post the match, went to extremely negative. And, and, you know, rightly so, when you lost a game or you feel you've missed an opportunity, and no one's talking about giving anyone a free pass. But I suppose what kind of surprises me about it is a negative perception of something has to be based on what your expectations were heading into the game. And certainly mine were very low. Um, and, and 
if anything, they, they maybe even exceeded my expectations going into the game. So I don't know what evidence, like Burner just reeled off a litany of uh, scarring defeats in the recent past. So I don't know what evidence people were expecting anything other than what happened. I would say, Wesley, well, that's a good point. But um, I think that the, what amused me a bit is that I didn't, I didn't see a plan, a game plan. Like I was struggling to find what they were trying to do. In so have you seen? Defense. Have you seen one right since the start of Andy's time? I thought we saw green shoots against Italy, but it was against Italy, so we have to put that. And again, I was a bit worried after Italy. There was, I don't want to go back to the Italy game, but I went through it again there um, last week just to see. And even at the Italy game, we were at one stage we were twenty points up, twenty four three or something at one stage, and. We, we had a lovely corner to take on a little, you know, we a four on three and a spot out the back. And they're inside, we're just on the halfway line and we're 20 points up. And Johnny pokes it into the corner. And I kept asking myself, well, they're set up actually pretty well here. What's, what's, the, what's the reticence to play? We're not going to lose this game. So what I said, maybe this will kick in in the French match. But actually, I was looking at the French game again. I couldn't find anything resembling that sort of structure or shape in their game what they were trying to do with the ball. There was a, a lack of clarity of where their strike points were or what they were trying to get done. And a lot of it was down to bad passing. So like when someone throws a, a really bad pass and everything around it disintegrates. But I'm still looking for that kind of clarity around the attack. But whatever about that, I thought the defence was shambolic. Like, let's be honest, shambolic. And if we go back to against the head on Monday night, the clip burner went through of the, the ball being kicked down the full-back's throat and 14 players on one side of the field. That's unforgivable. And, you know, I'm not defending Stockdale because I think he's like a drowning man, but he's like a fellow that's been sent out to do a job and no one's actually told him what the important parts of the job to do. Now, that's all coaching stuff. That's not belief. That's not motivation. That's not toughness. I just think guys aren't on the same page because either there isn't a page or it's not very clearly they know what's on the page. I just see the lack of clarity. And then, so when Lenny Farrell comes off at the end, the thing that struck me is that we could have scored six or seven tries. God, yeah, I don't know where he's getting that one from. Well, I, 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 I admire his vision on attack, but I could not see six or seven tries for Ireland there on Saturday night. In fact, I couldn't see six or seven tries when they're still there. So there's a, there's a lot of mis, mixed messages at the moment. There's, there's mixed probably... messages how they're defending, how they're attacking how they feel about it. Like he believes they don't believe. So all these mixed messages um, are, are confusing. Like, and you can say, all oh, it's his first six nations, but yeah, but everyone's in, every, nobody else kind of look quite like, like that at times as Ireland have, and everyone's in the same boat. And after all, I would think myself as a coach, five games down the track, I'd like to think I was further down the track than I was after the first game. And I don't see that. So yeah, I, just, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I think I agree with Bodhi. Uh, I think, you know, we didn't expect him to go to France to win, right? Realistically, we thought France were improving. But obviously, uh, you're watching England, Italy, and, and only getting a, you know, a six point head start. And you think, right, if we can keep this tight, I mean, I don't think we should just accept it's a given that France would score lots of tries. Uh, like, realistically, the four tries they scored, they probably all could have been stopped with a, a more robust defensive system. And when you're away from home playing for a championship, you know, you need to back yourself that if you get 21 or 22 points, that should be enough to win it. You can't think, well, you can't think it, but it, it's unlikely you're going to go and beat them 35, 33 or, or whatever. Like, realistically, you have to say, well, let's get our set our stall out, good set piece, be physical at the breakdown, discipline, and, you know, let's let's stop them scoring more than, uh, maybe 20 points is too, is too late, but stop them scoring more than 25 points. But, like, the try, rather than just go to a brilliant team and great attack and they've got X-Factor, Realistically, our defensive system isn't in place yet. And that's something that should be. I know Simon's looking after defense now, but, you know, realistically, Andy has been there four years or whatever. Uh, our, I think our defense should be. I can give Kat some some time because attack does take longer. But the, the worrying thing for us is, is defensively, we're seeing the same errors in the backfield. We're seeing the same errors in the front line um, that we've had for a long time. Whereas you look at Sean Edwards, he's gone into France, he's had the same amount of prep time. Um, uh, and it's it's completely different. It's a totally new uh, defensive system with a new attitude. So there's lots of areas that like that 
we they need to look at. And I agree with you, Wesley, on, on paper as well, player pool wise, I don't think we're as good as France or England. So, you know, to win the championship would be a massive overachievement. But for us, we still have to hope that we can get to that level. And, and to do that, the team needs to be better organised, I think. Bernard, just, how do you... uh, sorry, Wes, just say one thing. Sorry for cutting off. We're talking about France as well. We're talking about France like they're all conquering all bells and whistles. Like this French team is not reached its potential or anywhere near it yet. We need to put that in that's of context on this as well. Yes, I think this French team are potentially World Cup winners if everything goes to plan for them. They have the talent. But last Saturday night, France weren't particularly good. They were when we gave them opportunities, they didn't waste them. And France are like the French are like that. But as Bernard rightly points out, this those opportunities should never have arisen. Like, and if you take those opportunities away from France, as we should have with our defence, France would look pretty ordinary. No, it was wet as well. So if, if it was a dry ball in Paris and we kept defending like that, it could have been a lot worse for us. So I, don't, I think we should be careful not to talk France. My point is, don't talk yeah. France up yet because they're not up there yet. You know, they went and lost in, in Murrayfield. So how do, you, how do you, either of you as a coach, like I, I saw in the Bledisloe Cup game as well there where there was a try where... The Australian hooker is defending in effectively. He's defending against the opposition first receiver on the blind side, and Moanga skins him as if he's not there the weekend. And you're kind of going, like, how did that mismatch come about? And then you go to the Irish game and you say, you know, the clip you showed or you referenced there with 14 people on one side of the field, and you're kind of, it's almost mind-boggling that in this day and age and the level of detail that's discussed and preparation, how that can happen, like. It, it's hardly planned that it happened. So is it is it purely poor decision-making individually that becomes collective or, or is it going down a rabbit hole with analysis and, and, and thinking you're trying to implement something that, that doesn't work or is it just a complete lack of attention to any detail that lets something like that manifest itself? Well, those two examples to me are down to bad coaching. Like, Take the Australian case, the hooker against Richie Munga. How you would have a 20-meter short side and a hooker as first, as first defender. Like, like, I don't know how Australia explained that. They, those situations can happen, but you don't have your hooker there. So everyone knows you've got to reset your line or you're going to get caught like that. So that, to me, was just how it... And I, I, I haven't looked back, but maybe Australia have done this before and New Zealand spotted it, or maybe Munga just looked up and said, happy days. But Ireland's one is worse, actually. Because one of the most important things when you kick a ball away in a modern game is you have to assume the opposition will run it back. And why a lot of teams don't run it back is they don't have an option to run it back. Your defensive line comes up and shuts them down. And that what we call transition rugby. When you have the ball to not having the ball. And when you go into transition, you have to have a plan for transitioning or you're inviting trouble. So we hoofed the ball down the field the other night. And 14 players, I don't want to go on about it so much, but it's absolutely dreadful to see that as something that wouldn't happen at club level. You know, that 14 players will be wandering around one side of the field and your only defender is your, your, your number six. He's got to defend 15 metres of space. So that try for France was made very simple by our kind of just poor defence. So that, that there are things that jump out and say, how can you kick a ball against France of all teams? And then you don't have a kick chase in place of that even resembles a kick chase. That to me is, is just shocking. So that, there, there are big questions, Wesley. Like, how, why, how could that happen with the same the head coach has been the defence coach for four years? And you've got to wonder, is there any structure around this? And it's, it's a pretty damning thing to say, but you look at that clip and I'm just scratching my head as to how that can happen at that level. And that's coaching. There's no, I mean, I don't know if Bernard agree with that, but that's my No, the first, I think the reason we're, we're harping on about it is that it's probably a long time in an international or even a, a top level European, even a Pro 14 game, or, or that you see that. Like I've, I haven't seen it for a long time where, you know, where Andrew Porter, your tie prop ends one on one with the winger, but that, that, that's a long time since I've seen that. And it's a long time <laughs> a clip where on in a two kick, kick tennis, we end up as lopsided on one side of the field. And, my fear is that, stock, you know, everyone's blaming Stock there, but he's the last gasp, you know, he's your last hope, and he has areas to improve on. But it's ignoring the, the, the issues about letting them break through so easily. 
Um, and like, look, maybe we didn't see it against Italy, but there was, there was elements of defence against Italy that weren't weren't great, and Italy were very poor. And unfortunately, it's back to England away when I think we all, okay, we criticised the backfield, but everyone just said, "Oh, power, power, power." That was that. That we're not we're a power deficiency. That's why our defence is poor. But realistically, you know, based on on the on the evidence of the backfield against England, um, some little clips against Italy, and then what we saw against France, there's more there's more deep rooted problems in our in our in our defence. Yeah, the the power game Bernard talks about with, with, with England is it's based on them get, getting the opportunity to overpower you in their setup. They run kind of three rook setups, which either ends up with you defending behind the game line in tackles or you're in trouble in the backfield. They're very smart at that. And we saw that in Twickenham, um, that they manipulated our backfield very well with kicks. So what England do is they get on the front foot. And then when England get on the front foot, then the power game is easy for them. But what you have to do playing England is not give them that front foot ball early and make them go to the power game when you have a chance of shutting it down. And that's how England, when we talk about England's power, it's based on them, you know, using a few, a few phases to set that up. And if, they, if you let them set that power game up, it's very hard to contain them. Not, not many teams in the world can actually. Maybe South Africa if it comes to it. But even New Zealand, Australia will struggle against that power game when England get going. So that's going back to that. But um, on last Saturday night, the French game, uh, they didn't need a power game when you leave half the field open like that. That's they don't need insane. a power game when you leave your tight hit prop marking game Pico. Just quickly on um, Stockdale, I know Robbie Henshaw, he kind of got one match at fullback. That, <laughs> that didn't go well against England a couple of years ago. Is there, is there more in Stockdale that he can learn at fullback? There seem to be a couple of fundamental things, and we know he played there at under 20, but is it something that's worth sticking with considering he was a 2018 player of the Six Nations player of the year on the wing? He, he was everything he touched turned, turned to gold. Is it not worth putting him back there? I know he had a bad season last year, but is he not just a very good winger and let's leave him there? Right. Simplify it. Yeah, he's a, he's a very good winger with the ball. Um, and he, it, but there's elements of his game that, that he needs to work on as a winger as well because there, he has responsibilities in the backfield. I think the reality is, unless, unless you're Rob Kearney, who has all this experience, and it's not just being able to read the play, he's, his understanding is he can actually try and... The thing about Rob was he didn't have to make many tackles or didn't really have to kick cover that much ground because he made sure what was in front of him was working properly. So it's a big ask for for Stockdale learning the ropes to to basically be the the, the quarterback of the defense as well and, and put everyone in position. Um, look at it, he definitely can get better at it, but he needs to be coached and he needs to probably play there a lot. And, and the challenge now is is rehabilitating him. You know, um, Wales are under massive pressure to get a win. What are they going to do? They're probably going to play low risk, you know, put a lot of a lot of kicks in um, and try and squeeze Ireland. And is Stockdale the best man for the job there? He potentially is, but he needs he needs some support around him. Stockdale Stockdale selection has become a multi layer problem for yeah. for Andy Farrell. It's obvious that the guy wasn't ready for fullback uh, at international level. Um, he was completely at sea, and he got away with it against Italy because we were on the front foot all day. But what's emerging as well is that, and I don't want to hammer him too much, is he's, he doesn't tackle very well. I mean, the, the Italian, last Italian try when number 10 went through, he bought a dummy like, um, and let him go through. He should have hit him so hard he could taste his fillings and make him make the pass. Again, last weekend uh, for, for Francis Troy, he let, um, he let DuPont run under the post. He had him there. Again, the very last, the, the chip over the top, um, Again, he made no tackle there. So he seems to me that he doesn't know what his job is at fullback. And then positionally, as we, we pointed out, he's about 10 yards out of position most of the time. And that's killing them in the backfield. Now, the second part of that is that, could he be a fullback? He could, but he's going to require a lot of coaching and a lot of game time. The problem now is that, the last part of my point is, his confidence has to be in the tank. Like he's... He, putting him into fullback again now in another test game is going to be a very exciting day out, which is what you don't want to fullback. A, a good defence system means your fullback doesn't make many tackles, if any, because he's your last line of defence. So if they put him in now against Wales, 
like he's going to be as nervous, even more nervous than he was in Paris because his confidence has to be shot. And you can't turn him into a full back in two weeks. So it's a huge problem now. We have a huge problem where we, the guy they want to earmark as full back, they threw him into the deep end. He wasn't ready. He's had a nightmare. I know what to do with him. Do you put him back in the wing and more or less say, you're never going to be a full back or throw him back in again when he's very vulnerable at a time when a team as Berlin like Wales will want to get a win no matter what. They don't care how they get there. Okay. So it's a really tricky problem for Farrell to fix now. Right, right. Because uh, there's risks either way, risks yeah. from either way. Absolutely. And I think that's because, to be fair to Stockdale, they put him in there and he wasn't ready and we paid a price for it. And it's not all his fault. Very good. I think as well, on, just on Stockdale, like, <clears throat> it could be way off here, but I, I, I think leaving Stockdale as an individual out of it, I think Stockdale's form has a couple of potential indicators for That's a good point, how right. this thing is going to evolve. Yeah, that's a good like, point. His form has dropped in last year, hasn't it? Well, as well, like, I mean, I think Bernard said the other night that detail has become a dirty word in Irish rugby because it's associated with the end of Joe's tenure. And, and like, we're, we've, we've selective memories, but one thing Joe was exceptionally good at, and there were many things he was exceptionally good at, if we want to be honest about it, was he got, he made individual players better in a lot of instances by f- focusing them on what they were good at or improving what they weren't good at. Good at. Sounds simple, but examples would be none of these things were exposed about Jacob Stockdale largely for his first time under Joe. Look how much more rounded the player Keith Earls has become over the last number of years, probably last seven, eight years. Look at Chris Farrell's form, the few opportunities he got for Ireland under Joe versus form for Munster at the time. And there just seems the lack of detail around how Stockdale performed his role, I think, is, is possibly illustrative um, of a lack of detail that could manifest and, and, and hinder this team going forward. And the testimony on Andy Farrell, and I heard Rob Carney saying it the other night um, on the TV, has been around has been extremely positive, but it's largely centered on his relationships with players. And it's a funny one that, that players saying someone's great um, becomes the only information point because, you know, it's, it's very hard to refute, but yes, but yet it's kind of um, illusory at times in the sense of well, what else are we basing this on? Um, to me, it always based something on a track record and the, the immediate track record is a poor-ish candidacy with Ireland's defence. Um, and a playing background in rugby league. And now we're complaining about the intricacies of fullback play not being coached in detail. And I'm kind of going, is, is, is there a chance maybe someone's not joining the dots here? Like- that's, that's interesting, guys. We'll, we won't focus too much more on the Ireland, or sorry, the France game. Just apart from a, <laughs> talking to Johnny Spe- Sexton was speaking after the, the, the game. He was asked if he had any regrets about their approach. But first asked about his, being, his reaction to being replaced while the result was still up for grabs. Yeah, I'm very disappointed. They're coming off like uh, like everyone will be. You're, you've, you're losing the game um, when you're coming off. So, what, what, what would you like? What would you like me to be doing when I'm coming off the pitch? I'm, I'm not just asking. I'm just asking what, what was going through your head. Yeah. Yeah. That, dis- that makes- dis- disappointment. Disappointment that uh, that you know we we didn't win the game. Um, you know we were 28-20 down with. You know, obviously, 10, 12 minutes to go, and we have a five-meter line out, and we we didn't capitalize, and um, they're just the moments that we look back on and regret. But um, I'm sorry, I wasn't delighted uh, coming off. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, Johnny. Uh, in the first half, you seemed to be going for the tries instead of maybe building on France's appeal discipline and kick the points. Um, do you have any regrets? Uh, no, because they had a yellow card. Um, so for 10 minutes, I think three of my decisions to go to the corner was when they had a yellow card. A couple of them, we're, we're, we took the scrum, we nearly scored. We should have scored from a couple. And then obviously just before half time, um, yeah, we could have taken three and, and tried to go in, in the lead. But um, look, obviously we, we knew we had to win the game by more than six. Or, or get four tries. So we were trying our best to uh, 
to put the pressure on because we knew the, the French team with the players that they have can score tries out of nothing. It's a bit like when you're playing the All Blacks, you know, you have to have the mentality to go and score tries and, uh, you know, sometimes it comes off, sometimes it doesn't, but um, the decision I thought was brave, of course, but uh, the execution, we didn't, we didn't uh, back, back up the decision. That was Johnny Sexton there talking to reporters via laptop from Stade de France. Um, we've had two former Ireland captains condemning his actions coming off. Uh, and indeed, Brian O'Driscoll said that he owes Andy Farrell an apology. Eddie, what would you be doing in Andy Farrell's shoes? The, the, the head shake was one thing, but the, the, how long it went on for and how pointed it looked uh, was probably a different thing. What would you have done? Well, first thing I wouldn't have substituted him, uh, to be honest with you, uh, because I don't think that my sporting program is going to change the game. But that's neither here nor there. That's, that's Andy Farrell's call, and I respect that. You know, he, he thought that was needed. So I just, I was very surprised. Um, I know, I, we all know Johnny Sexton is uh, a really intense guy, and he's very competitive. And like all the great players for Ireland, whether it's the Raj or the Pauly or the Woody or the Dricos, they're always very hard on themselves. That's the first thing you say. And they're actually never happy. Like, most of these guys, after wins, are still unhappy because they dropped the ball or something. And Sexton's in that mode, which makes him what he is. Makes him the leader, the go-to guy. And we've seen that, you know, in fairness to Sexton, over the years, he hasn't backed down in the big moments. Like, so, credit where credit is due for all that. But he has to also recognise that his position then is under scrutiny in terms of how he reacts to things. So, for me, his reaction last Saturday night was the worst possible reaction. I get he was upset, I get he was annoyed, I get he didn't want to come off. They rarely do. But he's, he has to, for the, for the good of the team and to show leadership and captaincy, he has to bottle it up. And it's no big deal. You go to the bench, you sit down, you give out to yourself, and then after the game you go to Andy Farrell and you say, I want to talk to you, why don't you take me off, I'm really pissed. And you have your debate with Farrell and he explains his case and that's how you do it. You do not throw the coach under the bus walking off the field. But, now, it's one thing some young winger who gets the shepherd's crook and all in and he's upset and he's inexperienced and he's emotional. Johnny is no spring chicken. I'm not referring to his age. I'm referring to the fact the guy is one of the most experienced rugby players in the world. He has to know better than that. He has to know that his reaction is going to be magnified. And he has to know that by doing what he did, he kind of undermined the player going on to replace him. He undermined the team and he undermined the coach. And I, I do agree that he should probably apologise. Yeah, he should apologise to Farrell, but I don't think he should be to the media. I think he talked to Stuart Farrell. But what disappointed me is that for all his achievements, for all his abilities, and for everything we like about Johnny, that that was an amazingly poor decision on his part to let his emotions run. And he, I kind of he knew he was doing it. I know it was an accident, and I think it has damaged his relationship now, whether we like it or not, with the team and with the coach. And every time Johnny gets sub now, everyone's going to be watching to see what happens, and it's always going to be in the air. And it was totally unnecessary, totally unnecessary. And it just adds more hassle for, for Farrell now going into the next round of games. How is Johnny going to feel? And, even when, and I've no doubt that Farrell himself have ironed this out behind closed doors, as it should be done. But we all know that's still there. It's still hanging in the air. And no matter how good they feel about each other today, we all think there's something going on. And I think for that reason, I'm just amazed that a guy who's experienced a strength of character let himself fall into that trap. That's just me. Bernard? Yeah, listen, I don't disagree with Eddie at all. I think uh, he'll regret it for sure. I think they're making a, a joint statement tomorrow, so hopefully that'll be the end of it. But he just, just knowing him, he wears his heart in his sleeve. He, even with experience, he hasn't been able to be able to park things. He just shows exactly how he feels. And uh, in some ways, it's a weakness, but in other ways, it's probably his strength as well. Why he's still so driven. But look, it wasn't a good. It wasn't a good moment. It wasn't a good image. And uh, yeah, he, I, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure he'd apologise for it. And, and hopefully, he came well, there is damage around it all. Of this, this yeah, doesn't sure. go away. Like no, I know. I can make a joint statement tomorrow. And a kiss and make up. And, and I'm not saying that's false. Don't get me wrong. I think, look, they, they have worked it out. I have no doubt they figured it out. And, and Johnny probably apologised for it at this stage. 
But I just think it's another hassle that Farrell doesn't need at the moment. It's hanging in the air. And it'll probably hang around for the autumn. And everyone's watching to see what Johnny's going to react to everything. So it's just extra hassle that was going to need it. And I'm just surprised the guy of his experience let that happen. Yeah, I agree. Wes, what do you think? Um, I kind of, I'm a bit nonplussed about it, to be honest with you. I think the bigger story was the way we were walloped out in the pitch. After, Not that it would be, was the bigger story in the aftermath, but... Um, we won't labour yeah. it, so that's, that's fair enough. Um, Look, I think, <coughs> I think sometimes Irish sportsmen, ever since Saipan as well, like love to go on about, you know, this, they've ta- how much they've taken Roy's like prepare to fail and you know win at all cost mentality to heart and to me I kind of the most disappointing aspect of it for me was that I think he saw what he was doing in the screen and did it again I was kind of going well what are you doing showboating like I mean that was mm. ridiculous um I, I'd kind of go along with Eddie in the bigger picture I, at this point in time I think it's just a needless distraction and another layer of crap to deal with when there's a lot of substantive things that need to be dealt with. Listen, you're right. If we won last Saturday night, we wouldn't even talking about this. But I know my experience, when you're losing or things aren't going well, every small detail becomes magnified. And that's what's happened here. Wes, he's right. This is not, in, in, it's not important in the big scheme of things, but at the moment it's important because it's just another aggravation they don't need. Very good. Gents, uh, can I just get your thoughts on uh, Razzy Rasmus's comments? And um, just for anyone who doesn't know, the context is a documentary about South Africa in the World Cup, and they were building up to the Wales match, and he said that Wales aren't soft, they're not like Ireland. Was there anyone here, um, I know it's the middle of a team talk, and Eddie, you were saying on Against the Head, who, who wants to have their team talks? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I did a few things my time I wouldn't like you know outside the change on my team talks is there anyone here who can hold their hand up and say to Razi I don't know what you're talking about um, or does was he trying to point out that where Wales draw their players from where, versus where Ireland traditionally draws players from and South African guys coming from the townships and coming from farms and do you know what he's talking about or do you no, no I don't think it's anything I don't think he's going that, that deep I think it's it's a reflection on how poor we were the previous week against New Zealand. So, you know, Southern Hemisphere team, Northern Hemisphere team, you expect this World Cup quarter final, you expect it to be tight, you expect it to be physical. And most South African players would have watched Ireland just completely fold. And I think he's he's just trying to, you know, Wales, if you remember, you know, they were they were uh, really struggling with injuries going into that semi final. So I think he's just trying to hammer home that this game was going to be way different and that Wales wouldn't back down. and. Um, just making sure there was no complacency. I, I don't think it's a it's a direct slide on us. It's just one of those things he's he's using as an example. Um, and Ireland, Ireland were soft against New Zealand. Like we were, like we kind of. I didn't mention that in one of the in, in terms of the big defeats, but like we were brutal, brutally bad, and we weren't physical or we weren't hard or or we didn't stay in the fight. So uh, I think look, at it, it's it's you're it's, not reading into it. Okay, you're no, not reading that. Definitely into not. It. Wes, do you read any more into it than Bernard does? I, I don't read into it on the basis of what Razzy said. Like, I don't think Razzy's thinking about the hardness of Irish rugby or otherwise. It's just a, a throwaway comment in the heat of the moment that probably actually I hadn't even considered the context that Bernard just went on. Mm. I think if you wanted to read in it, is there possibly a perception, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, that, that we're, we can be pushed around a little bit? Yeah, I think, I think there could well be. I don't necessarily think it's true, but it's a perception. Like, I mean, the same way it's a perception and uh, historically that New Zealand look at Australia as being a bit soft when push comes to shove. Again, it's not true, but, you know, I mean, we do draw 90% of our players from a upper middle class private school background that they don't in New Zealand or South Africa. Are, are they traditionally a little bit hardier? Yeah, I probably think they are. Um, I don't think there's any news in that, really. Um, I still don't think, though, Wes, we have already said he can never go back to Limerick again. Who can? <laughs> Razzy or me? <laughs> well, you better be careful as well, but Razzy's, uh, Razzy's on thin ice to Limerick saying Irish rugby players are soft. I just... But I mean, you look, look at, uh, look at, like, with all due respect to the guy, he's a great player, he's a great future in front of him, but, like, what do you think Caleb Clark is saying to himself when he stands opposite Hugo Keenan and they're about to play each other. 
Do you think he thinks he's going to be physically pushed around? No, but I mean... Or do you think pushed? he thinks he'll physically push him around? Yeah, but it, I don't think that, I don't think it's about size. I think it's, it's, it's not the dog in the fight, it's the fight in the dog, you know? And yeah. if but I if was going over Keenan, I'd probably. be looking forward to playing Caleb Clark because, you know, that's your chance to prove yourself. It's, it's no big surprise if, 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 if Caleb Clark runs over a guy who's 10 kilos lighter than him. It's not, you don't have to be hard to do that, just to be big. So, like, I yeah. think if you want to take this comment, and I, I agree with you, I think it's a bucket of steam. Like, I don't care what Razzie thinks anyway about us. It's what we think about ourselves. But if you're going to unpick it a little bit, um, Irish teams have never been called soft, physically soft. Like we, in fact, our problem was years ago, we traded on that insane hardness. And, 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 and like we, we were known as the 20 minute storm. The French are always regarded when you played Ireland, there was a 20 minute storm. And if you could weather the storm, then you'd win the game. Because we would, we would go like mad dogs in a meat house and then we'd run out of steam. That day is well, well gone. And that was one of the things I used to say, like that was a tradition almost carried in to my year as Irish coach, that we were a team that could go on one Saturday and scare the crap out of the All Blacks and then struggle against Japan next Saturday. That day has to be gone. But I, I don't, I think like Irish rugby players would be probably insulted about being soft. And again, I know you're, you're a middle upper class thing, but one of the toughest players I've ever coached is Brian O'Driscoll. Like, he's one tough guy. You know, he was every bit as tough as Paul O'Connell. Eddie, so, in, in, in the aftermath of Soldiers Field a couple of years ago, how did New Zealand go about writing that wrong the following week? What did they trade on? Oh, yeah, they came in, they went to war. Yeah, in what, why? I mean, is there, I'm not saying it's true that we're soft, but is there a perception of, yeah, let's well, see what they're about now? Well, I, I, I would look at the other way. I think New Zealand came into Dublin that week, and they were the, one of the greatest motivators for anybody is fear. Like women lift burning cars off their kids out of fear. And Irish rugby teams played on fear a lot of times. As Bernard, you know, like you, if, if you're with Connacht and you're playing to lose in, in, in France, there's a fear factor. So when New Zealand came to Dublin that autumn after losing in Soldier Field, and losing because they set themselves up to fail, like the thing that week that struck me is on the Friday before the game, I was in Chicago. And the All Blacks were the top of Michigan Avenue playing baseball because the Cubs had won. And I said to myself, that is so unlike the All Blacks. And I went out to Solar Field the next day in Ireland, gave them a spanking. So they came into Dublin the following week. And the fear of losing in Dublin and getting on a flight back to New Zealand was unbearable. And they reacted as New Zealand teams do. When you're on tour down there and you, you scare the shit out of them in the first test, the second test is going to be a bare knuckle brawl. No. They are, they are physically hard New Zealanders and they are tough lads and they can do that. So I think it was more how New Zealand didn't say, oh, Ireland are soft, let's up it a rat. Ireland, New Zealand were playing for their lives in Dublin. And that was the reaction. It wasn't that they thought we were soft. They were afraid that if they didn't up it a notch physically, we, they could get caught again. So I, I didn't read it like that. Should we, should we go down the French route, Wes? Did you have a theory on that? I didn't have a did theory. They, did I just thought it was interesting timing. Uh... You know, there was an article about their tight head uh, house, um, who was a very colourful background to be kind to him um, in terms of brushes with the law and things like that. And that kind of comes from a very tough Algerian community in, in France and, a, you know, an urban environment. And it just kind of, it was just because of the timing that it came with Razzie's thing. Like, I'm, I'm not advocating we get a development officer up in Mount Joy or anything like that before the lads go mad suggesting that one. But... Uh, it just made me curious of, I wonder, could a player like that ever progress through the system in Ireland? It's, it, it is a very regimented system. And, and look, that's the advantage of having 60, 70 million population like France is that you can pull guys from all over the place too. But, um, you know, look, we're, we're, it's a professional sport. And I, I think we're always looking for ways to improve. And I think, you know, for all the growth of rugby, it's been a commercial growth and a growth in television spectators and attendances. But I, I, we maybe haven't expanded the playing pool as much as we would have liked in the last 20 years. And you know what? There is a big part of Ireland that rugby still hasn't penetrated. And you know what? A lot of those lads, if you go down to West Kerry or up to North Mayo or whatever, I'll tell you one thing, they're not soft, that's for sure. So I don't know why we're not trying to get into those marketplaces more. I think we are, though, as we fair. Yeah. I think the union have seen that. But they're hard marks to back into. Like, 
it's very hard to break. Like if you look at Gaelic football in Hurland, I'm from a Gaelic football area in Galway, and uh, the parish loyalty to sport and growing up from the age of eight or ten playing hurling or football, it's a hard thing for a guy to to, to go to another sport. Um, and some guys do, but if you're what you, what we want in rugby, to be honest, we're after the same guys that are playing in the All Ireland final. We're not after the guys playing junior B football or junior B hurling. We're looking for the same elite guys, and it's very hard to attract those elite players who make the county under 16, the county minors, the county under 20s, then the senior panel of 21. Getting those guys to play rugby is practically impossible. They're the guys you want, you know. So. It's well, the other thing be, rugby are able to bring them over, Eddie, with the lure of professional sport. So yeah, well, it has possible. it has happened to a degree, like you know, um, but it's never going to be easy because it goes back to the culture that guys grow up in. It's it's like I, I don't know. Would you ask a, a Kenny Hurler would you prefer an All Ireland or a rugby cap? I don't think there'd be much of a choice for him. What about so, you? Know, I'm, I'm in in, in Carlo, what were your options growing up? No, so I, I would have never played rugby only for I was spending too much time uh, at the marks and I thought I wasn't going to finish the leaving search so I sent me to boarding school but the uh, look, I think there is really good athletes out there I, I think I don't think we, we need non-rugby players to make the team hard I think Ireland didn't lose the game at the weekend because they weren't hard I think physically actually they stepped up it was, it was more around the organisation um, and the execution but I think for sure yeah you look at you look at Ellis Gange, you look at Kyle Sinclair, you know, coming from non-traditional parts, and yet now they're, you know, they're, they're playing for England, and England have a massive playing pool. So maybe we haven't had as many successes as as we, we could have. The problem is, you know, it's different Aussie rules. They come over and pick our best 19, 20-year-olds, and they say oh, in a year's time they're ready to, to play. Probably we need to have a, you know, a longer view and go, okay, well, that fella, it'll take him three years to potentially play professional. And at the moment... The, you know, for an academy manager to make that decision, often they have to be very brave because you know it's going to take resource. And uh, I think there's definitely an element of of having you know maybe 10, 10 contracts, small amount of money for wild cards, and just actually go out and look and see um, you know what you could do. I, I remember uh, Carlo had a very good midfielder, and he's still playing. I can't remember his name, and he was with the Sydney Swans, um, and he was homesick. And I said to Cheka, look at this fella, he went his very first day in Sydney Swans. Brendan Murphy, isn't it? Brendan Murphy, thanks. Yeah, his very first day in Sydney Swans. He coming from amateur, he won the anaerob or the aerobic test, like really good uh, aerobic capacity, uh, but didn't settle. Was a bit homesick, and I said to Cheka, and Cheka was like, "Yeah, we we'll give him a contract," and he and he offered him a contract. Uh, now, development contract, which is a big punt, and and he thought that he had capacity to be a really good number six. And the guy decided no. He, you know, he joined the army and, and, and continued to play for Carlo. And I think he's, he, you know, he maybe retired last year. But so they're like, Czech obviously being a Aussie and seeing this trans, or transition from you can play AFL, you can play rugby league, you can play rugby union if you're a good enough athlete and a ball player. It is possible. I just don't think it's going to happen at the moment with the resources we have financially. But I don't disagree that some of the some of the athletes playing hurling or GA could play for Ireland. It's just a case of getting them into the system and developing them. Guys, that's great. Listen, um, we're a couple of weeks out from the Autumn Nations Cup, so we're going to deal with. We want to have a look at that next week. So that's it for now. Thanks very much to uh, Eddie, Bernard, and Wes for joining us, and we'll chat you next week. Thanks, guys.